during the period of uh, the Civil War era in the late 1800s, one of the most famous sort of newspapers, magazines, periodical publications of the time was Harper's Weekly. And uh, drawings like this, political drawing, uh, is, is very, 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 this is a, a perfect example of a Harper's Weekly sort of illustration of the events at this time. And this is illustrating the dispute over the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau and the U.S. Congress's desire to expand the Freedmen's Bureau and use it as a body to help to rebuild after the Civil War. The Freedmen's Bureau is actually probably the first item in the fight between the presidency, Andrew Johnson, and the U.S. Congress led by the so-called radical Republicans over Reconstruction. So what was the Freedmen's Bureau? The Freedmen's Bureau, uh, it came up for renewal in 1865. It will be vetoed by Andrew Johnson, one of his first vetoes, and of course the beginning of a dispute in which Andrew Johnson, uh, you know, almost vetoed legislation, you know, you know, almost constantly. And he actually had much of his vetoes overridden by Congress. Congress, with a two-thirds majority, can actually override a presidential veto. But the goal of the Freedmen's Bureau was really to help the massive displaced populations from the Civil War. Um, it, it wasn't just freedmen. It was white and black populations. Remember, the, the South is devastated. You have some 20% of the adult age men in the South or young adult war age men in the South uh, killed, uh, fields are destroyed, towns are destroyed. And so the Freedmen's Bureau was designed to, um, to help deal with that. And so they did things like they, they established schools. And of course, much of this was to help the new Freedmen's population, the former slaves, obviously, um, hence the name. And so you had the establishment of schools. There was a great deal of, of volunteers. For example, many women volunteered and came from the north to the south to, uh, to work in these new schools to help uh, provide education to the newly freed populations. Um, the slave system had intentionally denied slaves you know, education as, as one of the vehicles for um, for controlling them. And so helping to educate the freedmen populations was very, very important when it came to making them viable economically in the post-war years. They provided medical care. Um, they also served uh, as a vehicle for land redistribution. So there were some areas that initially the Freedmen's Bureau uh, helped to establish uh, land redistribution in places like South Carolina to the new freedmen populations. And it looked like the Freedmen's Bureau would be a, 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 um, a very, very uh, good thing for the new freed populations, uh, the former slaves after the Civil War. It was a, a, it was a, it was a first in terms of federal, role, federal government's role in social affairs. So it was an unprecedented sort of um, amount of federal government sort of activity and responsibility in social affairs, but... Of course, we have to remember that uh, the level of this problem, uh, the devastation of the war, massive former slaves now, now freed, huge cities destroyed, um, agricultural you know, crops decimated, um, the, the obstacle here to overcome was massive. And so even though it was an unprecedented role, you know, a federal role in social affairs, it was nonetheless very necessary. Um, it was really the only way you could kind of deal with something on this magnitude. But the Freedmen's Bureau was opposed by many Southerners. Um, uh, Southerners often opposed it on the claim that the Bureau was corrupt. And, you know, while there may have been elements of corruption um, in the Freedmen's Bureau, the reality is that um, during this period of time, corruption was basically rampant in, in, in almost every element of, of, of state, local, and federal government sort of organizations. And in reality, the Southern opposition to the Bureau was not because it was corrupt, 
but rather because they did not want the federal government involved in these types of affairs. They did not want land redistributed to to the freed slaves. They did not want the involvement of, of federal schools, federal teachers or, or teachers from the North, uh, medical care from the North. They did not want this involvement in the South. Uh, many Southerners, the status quo, wanted a return to um, to, to something that was as close to the pre-Civil War era as was possible. And Andrew Johnson, who, of course, if you remember, was from Tennessee, and while he hated the sort of planter aristocracy of the pre-Civil War era, uh, Johnson was nonetheless a vehement racist. He was very stubborn. He had refused to secede with, his South, uh, to, with the South during the Civil War. And Johnson very much aligned with um, um, the Southerners that pursued a, a, a sort of white supremacist status quo in the South. And he aligned with them and he opposed Congress. He refuses to renew the Bureau in 1865. And this begins a really intense battle uh, with Congress as he will veto this. And you will see down the line legislation of his that's vetoed. Uh, will be increasingly overridden by Congress uh, a record number of times um, at the time, at least. When we look at the Reconstruction period, and you look at the Southern response to Reconstruction, um, some of the, um, the uglier aspects of racism in American society come out. And of course, you can see this, and we'll get back to that question in a moment, but you can see this with a, a broadside like this. So this is a broadside. This is a, this is a, if you will, a campaign poster, shall we say. Um, this is how racists in the United States, and this actually is not from a Southern campaign. This is actually from a Pennsylvania um, uh, political campaign. But this is how uh, many in the United States who opposed the Freedmen's Bureau and opposed reconstruction, uh, a reconstruction on the lines of, of creating greater equality and greater freedom, uh, regardless of race in the United States. They opposed this, and this is how they opposed it. And you see here uh, the numerous tropes of racism, um, as it suggests that, you know, uh, white people are somehow hardworking Americans, and the government's providing, if you will, welfare to um, you know lazy freed slaves who don't want to to work. Um, this was how many in the South. This was how the American president Andrew Johnson, oftentimes, and, and many of his sort of supporters in the American South would have attacked the Freedmen's Bureau with this sort of intense, uh, deep-seated racism. Um, about this. The Southern response to the Northern-led Reconstruction policy did not just take the form of that visible racism that you see in a political campaign poster like that. Instead, the South responded to Northern Reconstruction policy, which again, the Northern Reconstruction policy is now being really led by Congress. And Congress is saying, we have to create a reality where race is not the determinant um, of citizenship or of constitutional protections or of a right to vote. That we have to create a society that deals with those core issues that led to the Civil War. We have to create a more equal society. And so the Southern response to this, and it's again supported, that was a, that broadside was from a, a Pennsylvania campaign. And of course it's, uh, supported by the president, Andrew Johnson, um, the response of the South and its, and its supporters was to create something called black codes. Black codes were kind of precursor to Jim Crow laws, and we'll talk a little bit about Jim Crow laws a little later, exactly what they are. But they varied from place to place. And so the, the black codes were codes that counties would create. And they could vary from county to county. And what they were designed to do is create specific racial-based laws or codes uh, designed to control 
the freedmen population, the former slaves. They're like precursors to Jim Crow laws, uh, which we'll talk more about, but these were laws that um, not only excluded these people from voting, but freedmen under the black codes were often potentially subject to arrest for things like being allegedly idle, you know, not having a job or being on the road. And, you know, being on the road was a very commonplace thing because, of course, as we know in the history of slavery, that um, during the, the slave period of the 1800s, it was common practice for families to be broken up when slaves were sold at auction. And so if you were a freed slave and your father or your mother or your brother had been separated from you 15 years ago, the first thing you're going to do is try to find out what plantation they were sold to. And so the freedmen would oftentimes uh, be on the road traveling to neighboring plantations to see if they could locate um, loved ones that they had been sold in years prior. Being on the road, allegedly being idle and not having a job would result not only in arrest, but oftentimes it would, be, it would, it would, it would result in arrest and forced employment on the former plantation lands that they were once slaves on. They would be forced to sign contracts to work for their former master. And of course the contracts were um, you know, little more than a very, very small, uh, small wage um, and effectively compulsory labor on the land of their former master, uh, which of course was not far off from the feeling of being re-enslaved. Another response uh, in the South to the reconstruction policy of the North was terrorism. Um, and there was some very, very, very intense violence in this period of time. Domestic terrorism from groups like the Ku Klux Klan, of course. Uh, the Klan was formed in Tennessee in 1866. And uh, it was really a domestic terrorism body that sought to um, intimidate and harass um, the former freed populations uh, and to force them to uh, effectively um, not, not uh, push for uh, greater um, equality in society. In some cases, in uh, cities like Memphis, for example, there were cases where um, the former Confederate, white Confederate populations went on rampages and murdered dozens of, of, of unarmed freedmen in um, areas like around Memphis, Tennessee, for example. So you have a widespread use of, of terrorist violence. And here you see a, a political sort of drawing of, of um, of, of, the, of the Ku Klux Klan and its sort of alliance with uh, former Confederates in seeking to terrorize and intimidate the freedmen's population and thereby prevent them from uh, participating in what many in the Republican Congress at the time hope will be a meaningful reconstruction of society along the lines of greater equality um, for uh, individuals and constitutional protection for individuals in that society.